All right, I hope all of you either went to the Nature Journaling Conference last week or are planning on going because it was awesome. But even if you didn't, right now I'm gonna talk about a lot of the supplies that were mentioned. I spent over six hours going through all of the supplies lists from all of the different instructors and then compiling this list and trying to find links to where you can find all of these different supplies. Maybe I should have done this before the actual conference, but I have a feeling a lot of you have not taken all the classes yet and are thinking about it, or you are interested in trying some of the supplies that were mentioned during the conference last week. Many of you may be experiencing withdrawals after last week. I know for me, it has been really weird after spending 10 hour days nature journaling online with other people teaching and learning and then going back to my regular life. Wait, my regular life is teaching nature journaling and learning nature journaling all day long. Never mind. Anyways, I am going to start with a short little recap probably of some of the stuff that I didn't mention last time because I didn't do a recap of the very last day, but I will just quickly summarize and let you all know some of the stuff from the last class and then I'm gonna jump into this list of supplies. After I created this list, I found out that YouTube has a limit on how many words you can put in the video description. So if you look at the video description down below, you'll find out that I had made, I think my document with my list of supplies mentioned by all the teachers was like 16,000 characters long and about 20 minutes ago, or maybe it was 40 minutes ago, I did a search and realized YouTube only allows you to put 50. 5,000 characters. So I was a little bit over three times as many, too many characters and had to condense that list. What I'm gonna do though, is I'm going to make a complete list on my website with more in-depth information about every single supply mentioned during the conference. So I will talk about those now, but if you need to, you can go to my website, marleypiper.com, and I'll have a complete blog post talking about those. But you can see down below, I have a lot of the supplies for the first classes um, and then some got cut off at the bottom. Okay, so I'm going to, um, I think I'm just gonna skip the review of, the, um, of the, the conference final day. It was amazing. I basically took all of the classes that were there, ending with um, Kate Rudder's class about how to nature journal other senses, which was amazing. There was a class about glaciers, a virtual, um, a really cool virtual field trip to Alaska to an Alaskan glacier with Kim. Um, there was an amazing class with Robin. This was one of my favorites about um, how to use expressive expressive brush strokes using some of these different tools for nature journaling. Um, there was a, that was a, a really wonderful class, and there was a great class, really awesome with Vitor Velez. You've probably seen my interview with him. Um, some months ago, it was it was a really cool class. He put a lot of energy, I could tell, into organizing the information about composition. Um, before that, there was, um, I think that was the first class of the day, Creative Layouts, and um, Jack's poem in the beginning. It was definitely a long week. I actually missed the keynote with Jane Kim, but I have been watching it in little pieces on video. So. I, th I think it might be too late to sign up for the conference. I'm not totally sure. It might be possible to sign up for just the videos at this point. But right now, I'm going to go through the list of supplies. So starting off with um, the very first class was um, Melinda's class on nature journaling marine biology. And it was really cool. She talked about species from the Monterey Bay Peninsula and these are the supplies she mentioned, and you can look down below in the description for these, but she um, suggested the um, Canson XL Mixed Media Spiral Sketchbook, the 7x10 size. Um, she also recommended John Muir Law's sketchbook. Several people besides her mentioned that same Canson sketchbook. I think it could be a good option. Um, I personally don't really like the way the cover looks. Um, and that matters for me. I like uh, the black cover of the sketchbooks that I use, but especially if you're um, trying to get a, a good deal and they also have a variety of paper types, that Canson could be good for you. She also mentioned that she uses the platinum fountain pen. 
I'm not sure. Um, the link that I put is for the same one that Eli actually gave me and that I have been using since Eli gave it to me. And she said that her platinum fountain pen um, is a medium nib. And she says that it had a converter built in. I wasn't able to figure out which is the one that specifically that she's talking about. However, I did um, post a link to the Platinum Preppy, which I think is a good entry level one. That's the one that Eli gave me. And you can get a converter for that and use carbon waterproof ink, which is what she was recommending. She also uses the um, Pintel water brush that I think most of us use. Um, so she is using these, these water brushes um, as, as are many, many other people. And it sounds like she actually uses the medium and the large. So I have the links for both of those. And then she also does use um, the John Muir Laws custom watercolor palette. And I have a feeling these are gonna be on back order for a really long time because after the conference, everybody's gonna go over there and supposedly Fiona Gilogly is the one who makes all of these by hand. She's probably gonna have her work cut out for the next year because the wild, everyone who went to the Wild Wonder Conference is probably ordering these. So if you haven't gotten one yet, um, I'm sorry. Um, and so that was it for Melinda's class. Before I go into the next class's supply list, I'm just going to say hi to people here in the chat. Um, I really got here last minute because I literally was working on this list until the last minute. I spent about six hours on it doing the research and compiling the list. Um, I see that Angie's here. Hi, Angie. Hi, Ivea. Someone is watching from Facebook whose name I can't see, unfortunately. Um, Lori is here. Eli is here. Jean is here. Ivea, Zephy, Terry is here. Great to see you. Um, I think I mentioned Jean already. Eli, Lori is here. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Many of you are Patreon patrons. That is awesome. Um, really helpful right now for me having that support from all of you. Okay, so the next class was with Wendy Hollander, and this was one of the few classes that I missed, unfortunately. It was um, using colored pencils for um, botanical illustration, and she had a huge list of supplies. It took me um, like an hour just to go through her list and try to figure it out um, and make it as simple as possible for all of you. If you're just joining, you can see the list or most of the list down below in the description. It's so long that YouTube wouldn't let me fit all of it in there. Um, Wendy Hollander um, had a pretty long list. Um, let me know in the comments if you took any of these classes and have any um, sort of tips or recommendations about the materials used. So Wendy talks about um, several types of pencil sharpeners because if you've ever been frustrated with the sharpening of colored pencils, then uh, you know what it's like. Um, she mentioned this, um, the main one that I posted a link to was a Muji. It is a Japanese desktop uh, pencil sharpener that is cranked by hand. So really cool. It looks like a really good um, design. She also mentions the Faber-Castell pencil sharpener in a box. And this one looks like a one that could be potentially portable and could be good in a nature journal kit if you're taking pencils into the field. Not really what I do. Um, but she she does give information on that, and she also gives information about all the other things she used. I posted a link as well to her website, drawbotanical.com. She has an entire list and a little store there. However, I did notice that a lot of the stuff on her store was sold out, maybe because of the Nature Journaling Conference. So if you really wanna take that class with her, um, or you really want to get into the um, colored pencil botanical illustration kind of world, um, you can check out. I do have links on Amazon to some of the things she recommends. So this is a good time to point out that these are affiliate links. So I'm going to get a very small percentage if you actually use these links to do your shopping. I don't necessarily recommend that you buy all of your supplies on Amazon. There's definitely downsides to that company and supporting your local company, your local art supply store is way better. However, I do know that for some people, they're going to be shopping on Amazon anyways. And these links at least will give you an idea of what those supplies are like. Um, and when possible, I give links to, um, in this case, Wendy's website or Jack's website. 
um, the Art Toolkit website, which by the way, you can still get a 15% discount from um, today if you use Marley 15. But I'm trying to make a little bit of money this way using these affiliate links. Um, and so far, I think I've made about $5 through affiliate links. Uh, so thank you to all my Patreons, Patreon patrons, because that actually makes a way bigger difference. Um, my main goal here, though, is to provide a list all in one place of all of the supplies. Because for me personally, as a student, it was hard to figure out where all the supplies were, what I needed to get before the conference. And so hopefully this will help. And if you're just joining in, hi, Cindy. Um, hi, Kate. You can check it out down below. Kate, by the way, was one of the teachers at the Nature Journaling Conference. And some teachers had huge lists of supplies. Other teachers, such as Kate, did not. Um, unfortunately, Kate's list um, got cut off because YouTube did not allow me to put 16,000 characters into the description below, but Kate recommended the Fudenosake pin by Tombo. Maybe you could post that information in the chat, Kate. Um, super fun class with Kate about nature journaling the other senses. Um, so I'm not even going to go through the rest of Wendy's stuff. She did recommend um, basically Faber-Castell Polychromos pencils, which I think I've talked about before. Ray Bonto used those for a long time. She also mentions the Albrecht Durer watercolor pencils. And I think that um, Paul Vexche, who I interviewed about the fish illustration, I think that he uses those. Um, and then also Wendy mentioned the very thin pencils. Very thin is spelled V-E-R-I-T-H-I-N, and they're basically like a dark, uh, a harder lead um, Prismacolor pencil. Um, and most people, like I remember Jack taught me about this, most people will only have like three colors of those very thin, and you can use them to sort of pop out the edges. It could be in a mixed media illustration that has watercolor and colored pencil, and those very thin pencils are um, a harder lead, so that means you can get a really fine point and use them for little like edges. Um, so that is basically the end of Wendy Hollander's list. Wait, does she have? No, never mind. She actually had a bunch of watercolor brushes. She likes these Interlawn brushes, which I had trouble finding except on her website, um, which is drawbotanical.com. And she has a shop there where you can find those water brushes if you really want to get into botanical illustration. However, she was running out of supplies last time I checked. Um, and in the list down below, I mentioned the, um, uh, those brushes, the link to those brushes. Um, and also she said you could use water brushes instead. The other thing that she used was the Stonehenge craft paper. Um, she actually has a way that she creates a binding for those so that you can make um, you can make a journal with that paper and that is on her website as well. Um, and then I included links she talked about embossing, which is a special technique. I didn't get around to posting links for the magnifying glass she recommended and the um, brush. She recommends a brush to have that you can use um, with uh, you know, for brushing dust off of your, your desk. So um, forgive me if there are some errors in this list. Like I said, it took me about six hours to get it to the point where it's at now. You can follow along. Um, I, you should be able to follow along down below. Um, if you click on one of those links, I think it will send you off of the video. Um, and then, like I said, on my website, I'm going to post a better version of this that is complete because YouTube wouldn't let me post the whole thing. It was too much information. All right, so Amy Schlesser did an amazing class on doodle diagrams. I already talked about that in one of my recap videos, one of my favorite classes um, this last week. And she didn't really, she didn't really emphasize any specific uh, art supplies or nature journaling tools, but she did mention the book Dear Data. Um, I recommend looking at that book if you're interested in interest in unusual and creative visualizations of data. Um, there's another book that Akshay Gargi lent to me, um, and I'm blanking on the name. I think it's called Drawing Ideas. That might be another thing that could supplement your drawing diagrams. Amy's class was really cool. I highly recommend taking that. If you're not in the Nature Journal, uh, if you're not doing the conference or didn't pay for the conference, you can do a search on YouTube for um, doodle diagrams, and you should be able to find 
when Amy taught a class for Jack, John Muir Laws, um, several years ago about the same subject. Kristen Antonio did a really cool class on nature journaling microscopic stuff. And if you go into the link down below, I posted the recommendations she made that are specific for that. So she met, recommended this small portable uh, microscope that you can actually attach to your phone. I'm planning on buying one of those. I think it was like less than 30 bucks. Um, and uh, it connects to your phone. There's also the fold scope, which is an amazing technology. It's basically like, it looks like an origami kind of thing. Um, that is an, a really affordable, small microscope. Um, you can check that out down below. I just put the, the link to their website, foldscope.com. Um, and then I also put a link. It was hard finding the microscope supplies that Kristen was recommending. They're not on Amazon. Um, so I posted a link to um, Carolina Biological Supplies. I'm definitely not getting any... Um, affiliate benefits from um, those purchases, but it's a really good company to know about if you want to geek out on anything microscopic or anything sort of more sciencey supplies. And I posted a link to the um, types of slides that Karen, uh, I mean, Kristen recommended for um, doing those samples. Um, okay, I'm not, uh, not going to be able to read all of the comments, but thanks um, for everybody who's who's chiming in there in the comments section. I'm just going to uh, work my hardest to keep hydrated while I read through this list and provide a little bit of details. Next class in order um, at the conference was Karen Romano Young. She um, did not emphasize art supplies and actually her first viral science comic because she talked about uh, science comics and how to communicate science through stories. Um, her very first viral comic, and let this be a lesson for all of us, her very first successful science comic was done with highlighters, a blue highlighter, and like a Bic uh, ballpoint pen on printer paper. Um, and she was on an, I think she was on an Arctic icebreaker or an ant, yes, Arctic, not Antarctic icebreaker. And she made that with those supplies. So um, that being said, she did not really go, she did not have a long supply list, but in the link down below, um, I have included her um, books. Um, and I think everyone should check these out. I'm gonna actually do a little experiment here and see if I can go from my written list um, and paste it into the comment. I don't know if this will um, work or if it'll be clickable, but um, Karen's books look really cool and she has, um, done several about uh, different um, science concepts and making them sort of more, uh, making them more accessible to, um, uh, making them more accessible to kids. And she's found that the comics, uh, comics format has really helped her do that. And it's also really revolutionized the way that she tells a story and has made it a lot easier easier for her as a writer. I highly recommend seeing her talk and I think she has like an Instagram you can check out. Um, I definitely wanna follow up with her and um, learn more about what she's up to because it's really, really cool. Um, Ryan Pedersen did a class on nature journaling in the uh, Death Valley, in Death Valley, California. And it was, a, um, it was a virtual field trip let me just show you one of my pages real quick. I actually fill, I basically filled two whole um, journals um, during the conference. Uh, Ryan's class was really cool. These virtual field trips are something very neat. He's been doing it since last, last year. Um, he taught one um, and he does it at Stanford for his students there. Um, Roseanne has also been doing this a lot, but these virtual nature journaling conferences uh, nature journaling uh, trips are really cool and it was fun to take his class. He also uh, was a minimalist in terms of supplies, but I'll see if I can um, post his list here. Um, he basically, he recommended the Strathmore Visual Journal, which is a mixed media sketchbook, kind of similar to that Canson one that Melinda Nakagawa mentioned. Um, and uh, so very basic and he uses a... Um, 
a Bic crystal um, ballpoint pen. So very simple. But he did recommend a interesting, um, an interesting book. Oh, that did not that did not go through right for some reason. Um, so he inter he he recommended a geology book. Um, called Geology Underfoot in Death Valley. And if you don't, if you don't plan on going to Death Valley or you're not interested in Death Valley, what I learned was that Geology Underfoot is a series and there's several books in that series. Ryan Pedersen is a geologist and he recommended this book for people who are non-geologists and who just want to get a little bit of information about geology. So I'm guessing that the entire series is probably useful. I think there was Illinois, Colorado, Utah, Arizona, Southern California. I posted the one geology underfoot in Death Valley because that's the one um, that he mentioned. Um, then the next class in order was uh, Matthias Lanus. He is an awesome science illustrator. He's based in Bogota, Colombia right now. And he taught the class on um, water soluble pins. I used to use this technique quite a bit. I don't see mine right now. Uh, I seem to have lost mine, um, but um, the razor razor is one of the really common ones. He uses this pilot black razor point, but basically if you just test some of these pins out, many pins combined with a water brush like this can, pr can um, create um, washes um, because the ink is water soluble. So it's a really great and simple tool um, and, uh, he uses the Sakura water brush. So the link that I put has three sizes of Sakura and he also uses jelly rolls, white jelly rolls. This isn't the white, but this is a jelly roll pin. And a lot of people do use these for the highlights. Um, I, I don't use those. I use the same one that, that Jack uses, which is the, um, Uniball Signo, but those white ones will work as well. That was a really fun class with Matthias. Um, you can see here the effect. This is sort of the effect that you get with those water soluble pins. So you can see you can get the discrete lines of an ink pin, but you can also get washes. So to tell you the truth, if I could only have two nature journaling tools, like if I couldn't carry my whole watercolor palette, um, if I couldn't carry my whole watercolor palette, then I would just use a, a water soluble ink pen and a water brush. And with that, you can achieve so much. Um, I first learned about that, that system or that basic technique from Jack's um, how to, I think it's the law's guide to drawing birds. Um, the next class with, was Roseanne's class. And I definitely recommend you go to her website because on her website, she talks about and has a bunch of, she has a shop um, and she has a bunch of cool stuff in her shop. Um, I'll post it right here. It's called exploringoverland.com because she does all of these cool adventures in four wheel drive vehicles. Um, but what she, what she has, uh, what she taught was how to, I think it was called um, watercolor basics or watercolor with a simplified palette. And I, uh, and she talked about how you can do um, a lot of painting with a simplified palette. So if you like Tony Foster's talk, um, uh, the, the first night, uh, gosh, I'm getting all the nights confused now, but um, Tony Foster does a really minimalist palette, even though he's painting on huge canvases. So her class would give you the information that you need for that. Um, and she does, um, so I want, it'll be interesting to see if she sells out of stuff, um, as well because of the conference, but that's her, um, website there to the, to the minimalist paint kit, which has some cool stuff that's really well thought out. So it would be interesting to try. It's kind of maybe similar in some ways to, um, Maria Coriel Martin's art toolkit. Um, it's something that someone has really worked on a lot in the field. So, I haven't personally tried her kit, but I think it would be really good. And then she also um, has this whole long thing that I posted in the description down below about which are the specific pigments that she's using um, for the primaries and links to where you can get them separately. Um, and also what paper she used 
uses, which um, she's not that particular about. So the paper that um, I found a link for that I think is the closest to what you would need for that class would just be the Strathmore um, 400 series um, paper. Um, I'm not gonna po post in the comments her whole list of colors because it's kind of long and I didn't edit out all of her description about um, what is good for what. So the next class after that one was actually a really um, different one for me because I don't have experience with gouache. This was Liz Clayton Fuller's class and hopefully I'm gonna have her on the Nature Journal show soon. So a lot of these people that I've mentioned already have been interviewed on the Nature Journal show um, and some of them are hopefully gonna be on the Nature Journal show in interviews in the near future. Um, I think so far of the people that I've mentioned, the only ones that haven't been on the show are Wendy Hollander, um, Kristen Antonio, Karen Romano Young. Um, I have plans with Ryan Pedersen to teach about geology on the Nature Journal show and Liz Clayton Fuller. So that class was really fun. She actually uses Stillman and Byrne um, sketchbooks as well. When I went to my local um, store, I was only able to get this one, which is soft cover. I'm not actually a huge fan. This is Stillman and Byrne. They're, they're still my favorite um, sketchbook company. I'm glad I got to test this out, but I don't really like it. It even just look at the way it sits kind of like that. Maybe it's just my OCD or attention to detail, but I way prefer the spiral ones. And I think that Liz actually recommends that type. Um, and she uses one from Stillman and Byrne that has three different colors of tone paper. Um, I was only able to get, I wasn't able to get the one from her list, um, but this is the one from her list that I'm posting in the comments. Um, I don't think you can copy and paste from the comments, unfortunately, but that class was really fun. And I did buy, that was one of the classes that I did buy some new materials for. I tried at the conference not to break the bank. And that's what I recommend you do as well. Um, a lot of the teachers have provided explanations um, for how you can modify what you're currently working with for their class. Some of the classes are very technique specific. In those cases, you might need to get a few supplies. Um, Liz Clayton Fuller also talked about the brushes she uses. She doesn't, you, it doesn't seem like she uses water brushes very much. So I put um, down below and in the in the longer um, blog post about it, I'm gonna have more detailed information, but she uses um, regular watercolor brushes. She uses a ceramic palette. And one thing, a uh, word of caution, let me go get something real quick. So I spent maybe a hundred dollars on gouache. I tried not to get her complete list um, her complete list is down below. I didn't put links to every single paint color because that would have probably taken just about 25 minutes just for those. Um, but I did buy several of them um, and I posted a link to something that is sort of a halfway between her minimum requirements and the palette that she actually uses. One thing I didn't know from her list before I took her class and I probably should have uh, known, is that you can't just put gouache into one of these palettes like that you use for watercolor um, because the gouache dries up, it cracks, and then it starts falling out of here. And I think this is something that I tried at least one time before and failed at, and now I did it again and failed at it. So I think I've done it enough times where now I understand the principle so what I realized when I took her class is I saw that she actually has two palettes. She has a palette for mixing and then she has a palette for storing her gouache. The palette she uses for storing her gouache, she didn't put it in her, her supply list, um, but I'm pretty sure that I found it online um, and it's an airtight palette that keeps the gouache from drying up and therefore it keeps it from falling out of the palette. So I think what I've come to the conclusion that 
this is probably the main reason why people mainly use watercolor in the field and use gouache um, in the studio because uh, it's harder to have a palette um, that you use in the field um, that works with gouache without the gouache drying and sort of falling out. Um, and these airtight ones, I'm going to try it in the field um, if when I save up a little bit of money to actually buy that thing. Um, but for now, it sort of seems like gouache is relegated to the studio for me, which is something I don't really want to invest very much in art supplies that I can't use in the field because my main interest is nature journaling and nature journaling in the field um, or outside in a park or in a garden or wherever you can is, I, in my opinion, way better than nature journaling in the studio. So um, that was Liz's class. Um, I see that Eli liked that class um, and his um, supply, his doomsday supply of art materials has paid off. Um, that's awesome. Uh, next class was with Erica Stevens, and that class was um, really cool. It was about nature journaling dinosaurs. She did a virtual tour. Um, I think she would be a great teacher for kids. Uh, it, was a, it was a fun class, and um, I was definitely sort of multitasking a little bit during her class. I was trying to look at um, images of dinosaurs in other places. Um, because um, she was kind of, she had created a class that was sort of like you had to follow along with her. So maybe some other people ex uh, experienced that as well. Um, but I did uh, make these pages during her class um, based on the images that she shared and then some other images that I was looking up online. I learned some cool stuff about dinosaurs and Dinosaur uh, National Monument um, that's on the border of Utah and Colorado. Um, that was really cool, and she didn't really have a long supply list. Um, she likes to use the um, John Muir Law sketchbook for nature journaling, and she also uses some gel pens, um, and she is one of the people that uses this Koi watercolor pocket um, field sketch kit. So there's a couple of people who use this. Um, it's an alternative to, like, the Pentel um, Pintel Aquash brush that um, Jack uses and a lot of uh, a lot of people uh, people use. Um, so it that this company Koi, I think it's actually Sakura. Um, so the same company that makes the Micron pins, they make Koi watercolor. So they make their own watercolor and they make their own water brushes. So I'm going to post the link to this kit. A lot of you probably already have a watercolor kit that you like. I I definitely like. I still am married to this John Muir Laws one, but sometimes it's good to know about some of these alternatives that so that you can recommend them or try them out. And um, it, let me know in the comments if you've tried any of the Koi watercolor um, sketching kits um, or wa watercolor kits. And um, that's what Erica recommended for her class. And she also recommended gel pens. I spent a while trying to figure out which were the gel pins that she was talking about. I'm hoping to have her on a future episode of the Nature Journal show. Um, so maybe she can bring it up then. But my best, uh, the, the best one I came up with was this kit. Um, and it's down below um, where she recommends this. It's a gel pin kit. They're called, um, she called them artwork with a weird spelling. But um, when I looked them up, I couldn't really find them by that name. Anyways, it's a kit of um, it's a kit with uh, gel pins. So if you're into gel pins, um, you can check this out. They're refillable too, which is kind of cool. I thought this was funny. I'm just gonna post this in the comments as well. Um, she added this to the list, and I feel like this shouldn't have been optional. This should have been a mandatory. Um, this should have been a mandatory thing on Erica's list. <laughs> Curiosity and love of dinosaurs should be mandatory in a class um, about dinosaur. And I feel like curiosity should be mandatory in any nature journaling class. It's more important than a water brush even. Um, so that was a cool class. And uh, mandatory curiosity, yeah, that I'm going to make a t-shirt that says that. 
Um, then the next thing, and this was a speaker, a keynote speaker. I tried to see if some of the keynote speakers had things that I think would be useful. Um, definitely um, Richard Louvre, R Richard Love. I'm not totally sure. It sounds like people pronounce his name several ways, but um, I listened to uh, Last Child in the Woods as an audiobook um, recently and highly recommend it. If you saw his conversation with Jack, it was very interesting. Um, he also has a book called The Nature Principle. I recommend checking those um, both out. They, um, I think I might be getting to the point where I'm my list down below is cut off because YouTube wouldn't let me post such a long list of supplies in the video description. But like I said, on my website, marleypiefer.com, I'm gonna be doing a more in-depth um, blog post of this later. I did spend six hours making this list, going through all the different instructors' um, lists that they posted on SCED. Some of them were in PDFs. Um, and then from my own personal notes from taking the classes and tried to distill out this list um, with links to as many things as possible. Um, so I did my best, um, but it's it might not be perfect. So just a caveat there. But I just wanted to make it easier for people to figure out what were all the things? And I think that Ivea might be making um, a list as well. And Ivea is really good at um, creating these documents that are useful for everybody in the Nature Journal community and spreadsheets and stuff like that. So don't be surprised if um, Ivea shares something later that might be even more in depth than what I made and I'm sharing right now. So then the next class was actually with Jack. Um, this was the next day. Here are some of my sketch notes from the um, from Richard Lou's class. Um, these were long days, and so the next day, the very first class in the morning um, after the challenge, I think I think these first classes were at eight forty five. I want to say um, was the shiny bugs class, and we definitely ran out of time with this class. So as you can see, some of these didn't even we didn't even get to finish them. But um, it was a really fun class and um, some of the supplies that Jack mentioned because he didn't have a list of supplies, <clears throat> but I went through and tried to figure out what were the things um, that he talked about. Um, so first of all, he mentioned big hats and maybe that was just a teaching technique so that he could have something funny on his head while he was talking and get everybody's attentions right right off the bat. But he does have a huge hat, and he says go to a garden store and pick the biggest hat that you can find, biggest brimmed hat that you can find, and he, he looks for foldable synthetic hats. Um, so he has one that's lasted for 10 years. I have a really nice one that's made out of natural materials. It's like a type of reed or something, but it's already starting to break. I think I've been using it for three or four years. Um, so check check those out i i put a link to um one that i found from Col the company columbia um but if you go to a garden store a local garden store you should be able to find one um then all of his supplies that he used in the drawing shiny bugs class are available on his website um i'll post that here in case you don't know about it um and, and i'll also post this sort of list of stuff that would be on his website some of the stuff he used um, is not on his website unless you buy his palette. And like I said, that palette is amazing, but it's probably going to be out of stock for um, several months because of the Nature Journaling Conference. So Fiona Gillogly makes all of these. Um, maybe they made a bunch in advance preparing for this course. Um, but as it was before the course, they were always back ordered. Um, it's still worth getting one of these. I think they're $149. It's mostly Daniel Smith colors. Um, when I bought mine for the first time, I was definitely on a tight budget and it was, it felt like an expensive investment. But after buying this, I was able to um, do so much more with color and reduce all of my other art supplies. You really can do so much with this. I threw away colored, pen not threw away, but I gave away colored pencils and markers because this was just so superior. And um, this is my second one I'm on now and you can refill these. I'm gonna do a whole episode coming up about how to use this because I think a lot of people have bought these now. Um, and I'm gonna do an episode on how to use it, how to use it, how to refill it. I know Eli has bought a lot of the refill colors. 
So I'll talk about, um, you know, which colors you need to buy to refill and how to refill it in a, in a good way so you don't create a mess and don't, don't waste ink. Um, I'm going to do a class about that later. But um, he definitely mentioned those. Um, and so that, that list I just posted, those are all things you can get on his website. So the black rate Prismacolor pencil, the um, uh, non-photo blue pencil, the aquash water brush, and the blue pencil he used for highlights on the bugs. I didn't do that, but you might have seen he, he used a blue pencil very lightly in the back here um, to create highlights on these bugs. I didn't have that, and I'm not totally sure what color he used, but I would say just almost any Prismacolor, blue Prismacolor pencil um, would probably work for that. Um, right now I'm going to post the other things here. Um, this might be getting to the point where uh, um, down below you can't see these. Um, so I'll post these here, but he also used, I think he used his white gouache and he used several colors from his palette that um, if you buy his palette on his website, you can get them, but I'm also just going to post them here in case you want to buy the tubes separately um, or at least know what they look like. And it looks like that was too long of a thing to post in the comments. So I'm messing up the comments. I'm going to, maybe I'm going to stop trying to copy and paste these into the comments. Um, the next class um, was uh, lettering with Mike Rohde. Um, and he had an interesting list of supplies. It was really basic. However, I would definitely recommend getting his books. Um, Sketch noting is one of those things that I would consider cross training for nature journaling. And um, his, uh, his books are really great. And any nature journaler can benefit from learning about sketch noting. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, so his two books are uh, that I, I think he might have more, but his two main books are, uh oh, did I accidentally delete him from my list? Oops, shoot. There we go. <laughs> it's been a long day, folks. I was teaching a nature journaling thing for uh, school garden educators um, for four hours earlier today um, in the sun. Um, so Mike Rohde's books, um, these are his books right here. And I recommend both of them. Um, they're really good. Definitely get the sketch note handbook first. Um, I, I lent it to someone and uh, don't know where it is. So if you're the person that I lent um, Mike Rohde's uh, sketch note handbook to, let me know um, and give it back to me. I, I currently have the sketch note workbook, so I'll trade you. Um, and uh, he, he has really basic art supplies that he uses. His favorite pen is this black paper mate flare. Um, it's a really basic cheap pen. It might not even be archival or anything like that. He, he does a good job of scanning a lot of his work. Um, however, uh, it, he likes that pen the best and it's a cheap pen. So he recommends that. And then he recommends using gel pens. Um, and I'm pretty sure he's, he, he might be in the list below or he'll, I'll have his list on my website. Um, I've consolidated his whole list and created, found links to where you can find all of it. Um, but he didn't really have that many supplies. So definitely check out his books. Um, they're really useful. Oh, and I'm going to try to get him on the Nature Journal show. So if you're a fan of um, sketchnoting, I sent him a message on Twitter because he said he's really active on Twitter. So hopefully that will be a good way. And I think he responded, but I, it takes me a while to get back to Twitter and I've just been running out of time every day, so I haven't gone back to him yet. But I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that in his uh, message on Twitter, he's saying yes, or maybe it was LinkedIn. Um, after the conference, I've been trying to like message all of these people and see if I could um, get them on the Nature Journal show or do collaborations with them in the future. So if there's any of the teachers from the Nature Journal conference that you really want me to talk to, or besides Kate Rudder, who's here, of course, um, if there's any of them that you really want me to talk to, um, or have on the nature journal show or do a collaboration with, um, post in the comments, um, so that I know next class was da, 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 with Mark Simmons. Yeah. Cartooning, um, super fun class. Mark Simmons also is one of the instructors, 
um, that did not talk too much about supplies. His supplies are pretty basic, but he does awesome stuff with them. I did try uh, one of his techniques here. Um, I used, I usually don't use this very much, but I used um, opaque whites to fix his hands because one thing is if you've ever taken any classes with Mark, he's so expressive with his hands and with his face and you cannot get tired when you're listening to him, even over the internet. Um, he's super funny. I was definitely laughing out loud and really glad I didn't have to mute my microphone every time because I was laughing so much during his class um, and it was really good practice. Um, he talked about how important it is to tell a story and how important, how basically all he cares about is how your eyes move across the page. And he gave some amazing tips. I feel like I've read about how eyes move across the page quite a bit, but he gave some great tips um, and we did a session with him and he showed us in a way that was really cool because it was unscripted, how he would go about um, an outing, um, a normal outing, nature journaling, and turning that page into um, basically using cartooning techniques to tell the story of a nature journaling outing on your pages. And I'm quite proud of this page. Actually, I did it rather quickly during his class. I pushed my edges. Um, I did a limited palette. Um, I was using my Fude Demonin pin. Um, and it was really, really fun. Um, great class. It was exhausting. So if you were eating lots of snacks during the Nature Journaling Conference, raise your hand. Um, if you were really tired at the end of the day um, and your eyeballs felt like they're going to fall out, raise your hand. All of that is normal because like Jack says, your brain burns a lot of calories. For every three burritos you eat, one burrito goes straight to your brain. I'm pretty sure that's a direct quote from John Muir Laws. Um, uh, speaking of quotes, um, I wrote down a lot of things that Mark said because they were hilarious, such as my pens never die of natural causes. And he also said, I'm not worthy of moleskin paper. It intimidates me. So on that note, I'm going to talk a little bit about the supplies that he uses. I don't think I have them all on hand because I actually don't use, um, a lot of the things he uses are things that I don't use. Uh, I can't find, oh, here we go. He does use Micron pins a lot. So when he was talking about his pins not dying of natural causes, he was talking about Micron pins. Um, he likes to use the 08 um, pin for a lot of his work. Um, he also uses the zebra brush pins. This is actually one that Lori gave me, thanks Lori. Um, this is a gray one. I think Mark usually uses the blue one, which is black ink. It's blue on the outside, but it's black ink. Go figure. And it has, I think the blue one is like the medium tip. My camera decided it doesn't want to focus on my face. It wants to focus in close up. Come on, camera. And so he uses that. He also uses um, liquid paper, which I don't personally recommend. I, I use... Um, I mean, it's kind of the same thing, but he uses a different brand. This is the Presto Jumbo Correction Pin. So if you want to use white, um, these are the ones I recommend, but he uses the um, liquid paper brand. Um, and in my list, um, I did put the links to all of the ones that he uses. Um, he also uses these water brushes. And I can't remember, he didn't say which uh, watercolor he uses, but um, he also uses the Art Alternatives 11 by 17 sketchbook. So this is important. Let me show you. This is actually something that Lori gave me as well, I believe. Um, thank you, Lori. I think this is the same one that Mark Simmons uses. So he likes, I don't personally like this. I understand why some people do, but um, this is uh, does make it easier for, um, you can see all this dust is coming off because I've had this sitting on my shelf trying to figure out who I'm gonna um, give it to or what experiment I'm gonna do with it because I'm pretty married to the style of sketchbook that I use. But the benefit here is you can do really cool things across the, the middle. And that is why Erica Stevens also in hers um, mentioned this style. Um, so this style, I, I think the other reason, I'm trying to remember the other reason why he likes this, he likes cheap paper, um, which I think is, is really noble and commendable 
to, and, and um, Robin Carlson also mentioned this, but to just use the cheapest paper that you can. Um, and you can still make great art on it a lot of times. However, for this next class I'm about to talk about, oh, by the way, there's a couple things in Mark's um, list that I'm not gonna mention now, but they'll be in the list down below or the list on my website with the complete list of supplies and links to where to find them. But right now I'm gonna talk about um, the Sky Skyscapito class with Beth and Burton. Um, and for that class, the type of paper you use definitely matters. And I quickly realized in that class that my paper was not enough. So you can see here, this technique didn't really work. Several of these techniques did not work that great on my paper. So she actually recommends using arches. So arches, in case you don't know, is basically this fancy schmancy classic watercolor company. Um, they've probably been around since the times of the guillotine. I can't remember exactly, um, but she, um, talks about using the 300 GSM cold pressed watercolor paper. So um, 300 GSM is the weight of the paper, so the thickness, and cold pressed has to do with the texture. So um, just as a reference, the sketchbook paper that I use for everything, and I often do pretty heavy uh, watercolors, I would say, um, with multiple washes, is 150 GSM on the Stillman and Burn. So she's using twice that thickness and hers is cold press, which has a lot of texture compared to what I use. Um, Ivea has a really good question about the spine of the sketchbook and how his survive. I'm not sure. So this is the paper for um, Beth Ann's class. And if you really wanna do that class and you really wanna practice those beautiful um, skyscapitos and achieve that really cool grid effect, I do recommend you just get a big piece of the watercolor. I think the link I posted is to a pad that could work. Um, but if you just get like a big piece of the watercolor, you could use tape um, and she uses washi tape or masking tape um, you can use tape and you can tape off all these squares and just paint a sky every day. Oh my goodness, I am almost running out of time and I think I have like, actually this is probably perfect, I have like five more classes to go. Um, she also, in Beth Ann's class, I highly recommend doing that. I learned a lot. I'm really not, I do a lot of landscapitos, but my skies are sort of could use a little bit more work, especially in my clouds. So there's a lot to be learned in that class. Definitely watch that a couple times. Um, she, the specific techniques she talks about for how to create clouds um, and graded washes, uh, the clouds in particular is very in depth. So if you wanna get better, definitely check that out. She mentions masking fluid, which in my opinion is one of the um, hardest uh, <laughs> hardest, hardest um, things to work with um, in art and also just the least sexy. It's the only way I can describe it. There's something about masking fluid that is just, it's just not, I don't know. So um, she, she doesn't talk specifically about which watercolor she uses um, that I remember. Um, she gave a link to all the colors um, and says, you know, you use what you have. Okay, so after her, the very next thing was the keynote with Dr. Drew Lanham. And also, I'm really nervous, but I did send him an email because I feel like him and Richard Louvre and some of these other people like Mike Rohde, they're kind of big shots for me to have on the Nature Journal show. I'm a pretty small channel. Um, and I feel like reaching out and asking these people, or Amy Tan, um, uh, reaching out and asking these people to be on the show feels a little bit uh, nerve wracking. So um, I did send an email to him. So fingers crossed, I will be able to get him on the show. Um, Dr. Drew Lanham is an awesome ornithologist and professor at Clemson University. Um, he has a couple of books. Um, one is called The Home Place, Memoirs of a Colored Man's Love Affair with Nature. Um, and then this other one, Sparrow Envy. And it's really, really important for the nature journaling community um, to kind of be aware of what it's like for um, black men and black people and different people, different looking people to engage with nature, um, people with different uh, life histories, different backgrounds, and people that 
um, are perceived as different because of the way that they look. Because a lot of times we take for granted um, the way that we connect with nature journaler, uh, with nature um, as nature journalers. And um, so uh, Dr. Drew, not only was he extremely poetic, I found I had to take a lot of notes during his class because almost everything he said was quotable, but it was also, not only was he poetic, but he was also just providing a lot of perspective, um, especially if you think about the last year and some of the, the crazy racial tension in our country and um, these manifestations of the systemic racism that is still a part of our country. Um, he talks about that in a lot of his work. And I think it's really important um, if you feel like um, race and race relations is not your main focus and nature is your main focus, um, I recommend it. I recommend that you look into it uh, at least a little bit um, because there's a lot of things that um, if you're perceived as white, um, you're not noticing or you might take for granted. And so Dr. Drew did a great job about talking about some of those things. If you follow my show, you know that I did talk to Timothy Joe um, earlier in the year. Um, and he provided a lot of perspective on what it's like to be a black birder um, and a black artist um, in communities that are often uh, predominantly white. So it'd be really cool, fingers crossed, if I can get um, Dr. Drew Lanham on the show. He, he's an amazing speaker um, and, and brings a lot of interesting stuff. So let me see if I can find one of his quotes um, because they were so good. So this is the second nature journal I had to start um, because I filled up the first one. Wait, am I on? Maybe he was in the previous one. Okay, I guess he is in the previous one. I haven't indexed these yet, so it's still kind of hard to find things. He might have actually... Okay, here we go. Here we go. Okay, here's an awesome quote from him. He said, everyone has a bird story, even if it is just the chicken they ate last night or the pigeon that pooped on their car. Um, he said, don't be dismissive of, of the pigeon. So one of the things he was pointing out is that a lot of times birders or naturalists or nature journal owners, we might be sort of dismissive of these sort of like people call them trash birds or sort of these like suburban, urban uh, nature opportunities. And so he was pointing out that for some people, that is nature to them. They don't have access to wilderness. They might not have a garden in their backyard um, and they might not have a bunch of parks near where they live. So if their opportunity to connect with um, biodiversity or other organisms are pigeons or even something in the refrigerator or something they ate, that is still nature. Um, and it's really important in the nature journaling community for us to recognize that not everybody has access um, and that, you know, they might be, pigeons might be um, what they have to look at. So if I'm, if I mention sort of offhandedly, oh, pigeons, you know, that's a trash bird. Well, maybe some little kid is watching that and pigeons are basically like his main interesting nature thing that he gets to engage with. Anyways, Dr. Drew had a lot of um, really great stuff um, that he brought up in conversation with Jack. Um really beautiful quotes um and they they've known each other for quite a while they met each other a while ago um and it was it was a really great conversation between um the two of them so um one other thing i want to say say about his uh let me see if i can find another quote here um oh yeah he said this he said in, in one of his poems, I think this one was called The Same Groundhog as Yesterday. And this was like basically how he uses poetry um, in his, um, in his, as his form of journaling a lot of times. And from this one poem, uh, one of the quotes that I was able to capture in my sketch notes was, the turd thrushes are grim reapers of earthworms. And I thought that was so funny because uh, if you know robins the genus name for robins and some of the other thrushes is turdis which i think um is really funny so anyways i'm gonna just put links to his did i put oh yeah i put links to his books already um you can check those out um and definitely if you haven't already watched the keynote conversation where he talks with jack ah i'm running out of time so um some of you probably saw the interview i did with vitor velez a lot of people are watching that again that interview was done, I think the video is called Nature Journaling Style. 
I did it um, months ago. And because of that video, they decided to ask him on to Wild Wonder as a teacher. His art is amazing. Definitely watch that video again and definitely follow him on uh, Instagram at the headless sketcher. Can someone type the headless sketcher into the comments? Um, the headless sketcher, he used to never show his face and he's, he's very handsome too, but he used to never show his face. He would always hold his artwork up in front of his face. Um, and he was very shy and never taught or talked about his process. He came on the nature journal show. He talked about his process. It was very demystifying for a lot of people because you look at his art and you're like, this guy is unique. Where did he come up with this style? Nobody even looks anything like what he does. Um, but then in the, that interview, he talked all about it. And then he came to Wild Wonder and taught an amazing class about composition. Um, super cool. And you could tell he spent a long time and he was just really excited to teach. Um, really excited to be teaching. Um, and oh, geez, I'm realizing I missed some, um, I missed Amy Tan on here. Um, but most people probably know her books already. Um, and she didn't mention, I don't think I remember her mentioning specific supplies. She did mention a bunch of stuff about um, bird baths and bird feeders. Um, Vitor didn't mention very many supplies either. The really weird thing I thought was that he likes using short pencils, which to me kills my wrists, but he actually takes his paint brushes and he cuts off the back of them so that he can hold them. I don't even have a pencil short enough to show you, but he likes to hold them basically um, so that they're like this, where the back is basically sort of inside of his hand um, like that. Um, and the pencil he was using in his demonstration was like that long. Um, so anyways, if you look down below or when I finish that post um, on my website, I will have all of the, the colored pencils that he mentioned. Um, and then Robin Carlson's class, I already mentioned it. It was with brush pens. Super cool. I love brush pens already. And I have been trying out some of these new ones that she recommends, such as this one, which she says is her favorite. It's the Pintel Pocket Brush. Not only does it look cool on the outside um, and turn something potentially messy and ugly into a nice package. I mean, like, look at this in comparison. Um, this one has much more of a elegant um, package on the outside, um, and it's really, really fine tip um, brush pen that can still put out a lot of ink. It's really lightweight, and it's refillable cartridges, easily refillable cartridges. So I'm going to post the link to that. Um, it's a really useful one. I, I have known about it for a while, but it wasn't until... Um, it wasn't until this Wild Wonder conference that I actually um, bought one. But that's Robin's favorite tool. She also uses some of the other tools I like. She um, didn't use this in the class, but she did mention this um, Fude Demonen. This is by Sailor. They're a Japanese company. Um, and they make this really cool fountain pen. It's been sort of a love-hate relationship for me with this pen. Um, I love the marks that I can make with it. That page I showed you earlier from Mark Simmons class was done with the Fude Demonen, and I actually used it for half of my note taking during the conference. I think I was refilling it like every day, at least once a day because I was using it so much. Let me just show you what it looks like and how much line variation you can get. It can be your main mark making tool. Um, so right here in, um, this is Kim McNett's class. You can see I have the, uh, I have some really heavy blacks, um, and then I have really fine blacks that I use for my writing and for finer, um, finer artwork and see how that creates a visual hierarchy. Even from far away, you can still see some of those elements actually it would be better if I had like a dark title at the top, but that is all done with one tool. And when you're sketch noting during a conference like this, um, having one, one tool is a lot easier than trying to switch back and forth. So you might know that I really like this double-sided um, Pilot Fudayaku pin because I can create a visual hierarchy with this um, because of the gray on one side and the black on the other side. However, if you're sketchnoting at a conference and someone is talking, a lot of these presenters were talking really fast. 
even just going between one side of this and the other side of this takes a lot of time. However, um, and sometimes you mix them up, you end up using the gray side when you want to use the black side or worse, using the black side when you want to use the gray side. However, with this food aid demo in, the way it works is, hopefully you can see this, um, the nib right in front of my forehead is bent. And what that means is if you hold it this way um, and draw like on top of my eyebrow, maybe that would work because I hardly have any eyebrows. Um, you can get a fat line, but if you rotate it and hold it this way, point down, you get a really fine line. And I would say it's probably like the difference between the two is probably um, at least twice as big, if not three times as big. So that is enough of a difference to make a really noticeable visual hierarchy between those two elements. Um, and I wanna point out that Vitor Velez used the term visual hierarchy in his presentation. And I was like, I was like jumping around in my house when he said that, because I was like, yeah, that is what I'm talking about right there. Uh, visual hierarchy is super important. Um, go onwards with Robin Carlson. What a great class. Everything, um, everything she talked about, I was like, yes. And I love her art. Um, the way she makes marks, um, and the way she nature journals and the subject she nature journals, um, and the way she composes her pages and uses sometimes, uh, limited, um, palettes is like really something I've looked at her work for a while and be like, yeah, that's, that's something I want to kind of aspire to. Um, so for example, in, in one of her exercises, we did this, these techniques where we used a limited palette. Um, and one thing she said is one mark of the brush pin can convey a lot of information that is super important when you're in the field, if you are in the field and, and she nature journals a lot in the field, that's another thing that I like about what she does is if you're in the field and you have a tool that allows you to convey a lot of information with a few marks. That is a tool that you want to have. If on the other hand, uh, let me give this as an example. Um, if you, on the other hand, you have a 0 0.03 mechanical pencil, um, one mark from that pencil is not gonna convey that information and you're gonna need like 20 hours to, to convey this same amount of information that took 20 minutes with a big fat um, brush pen. So that was a really, I loved how she described that. Um, and she also talked about the Kuretake Fude Pin number eight. I still haven't tried that, but it's in the list that I'm going to put on my website. Um, and she uses the, um, she also uses uh, just one of these regular water brushes with ink and paints with it. And that's something that Steta did in her class as well. Um, and then you can also put ink inside of these. And she talks about that. Um, and she also uses the Aquash Gray. So it's practically the same as this, but it's it has a cartridge built into it with gray ink. Um, you've probably seen me talk about that before. Here you can see I tested out all of the different things she was talking about, except for the the um, the Kuretake Fude number eight, which I don't personally own. But I did try out all these other things um, during her class that she mentioned. Really great class. Um, and really awesome nature journaler that I have a lot of respect for. And another nature journaler I have a lot of respect for is Kim McNett. She's the one that uh, nature journals does some really extreme nature journaling up in Alaska, even in the winter in the Arctic Circle. Um, she's nature journaling and she did a really cool class that was basically a virtual field trip um, in coastal Alaska. Um, she didn't have a huge materials list, um, but it's in my list. Um, and she talks about dry bags for keeping supplies dry. Um, she uses these Sea to Summit ones. Um, I'll just put that here because that's something I haven't talked about yet. Um, those are useful. I have used some of those when nature journaling in places where my supplies might get wet. Um, and she uses some of the same stuff that a lot of other people use. Prismacolor non-photo blue pencil. She uses a mechanical pencil size 0.5. She uses really small micron pins, 0, 01, 0, 03, and 0, 05. She uses a clear pocket ruler. Um, I use the goniometer, um, and I posted a link earlier of uh, a cool clear um, uh, pocket ruler, but Kim uses it in a neat way. She uses it basically as her viewfinder. 
So this is a really cool idea that I want to work with more, but you know that I carry these plastic. I started using these plastic viewfinders after a while of um, use. I used to use these paper ones and then I realized that this plastic one would take up less space and I could actually just look right through it. Um, it's also more durable, the plastic. But what I saw that she did, this is amazing. She uses her ruler the same way that I use this. The benefit being, you know, on some of these, I've made marks on them. So I know like where the halfway points are and stuff like that. Um, the ruler already has those things. So if you're doing a landscape ito this big, you could be looking through your ruler um, and using it as your viewfinder. I thought that was really cool. And I'm definitely going to have to experiment with that because that would be a way um, to reduce uh, uh, the number of supplies that you carry and get multiple functions from one. I did post a link to a really cool looking um, ruler that has a lot of sort of like quadrants on it that could be good for that. Um, expect to see more about that in the future. So for some reason, my nose is really tickly. So I keep, um, keep rubbing it. And then the other things that she uses, she uses the water brush, uh, Pintel water brush, and she used, she recommended watercolor paper, cold press 140 pounds, um, for her class. Um, that was interesting. That was sort of surprising to me. And then she uses these, um, M gram watercolors. So I'll just post a link to one of them. Actually, I'll post a link to this cerulean one. Or was it the cobalt teal? One of these was that really perfect iceberg color that I didn't quite get. I think I used my, my I used my Daniel Smith colors, um, and I think that uh, I didn't quite get the right um, the right iceberg color. Now I'm, I keep losing my. So there is this sort of weird blue color that icebergs have sometime, and um, I don't know exactly what it is, but uh, for some reason, the color that I was using, uh oh, I just made a mistake and deleted something. Um, the color I was using was not quite the right color. And when I, oh no. Okay, there, whew, I accidentally deleted this part from my list. My list that I spent so many hours on. Um, command copy. Okay, these are the colors that she used to get that amazing um, iceberg color. So if you took her class and you weren't totally sure why your um, iceberg didn't come out the right color, I'm pretty sure it was either the cobalt teal or that cerulean blue. And she uses M. Graham. My, I sort of, I think sometimes we simplify things or develop brand loyalty because it just makes it easier. So because I, I got my watercolor palette from John Muir Laws and sort of, he's, he's obviously like my main teacher. I just stick to Daniel Smith now. And so if people ask me, I just recommend Daniel Smith. I haven't tested side by side every Daniel Smith color compared to, to every other companies. I mean, it took me long enough just to test all of the colors in here. That was like a huge labor of love. Um, I chewed off all of my fingernails, but I definitely haven't tried all these other brands. But one thing I noticed was that my blue didn't quite match those icebergs. And when I looked up the blue that she was using, I realized, okay, I think this might be why she's using those M. Graham colors. So if you have time to overwhelm yourself with testing out a, a bunch of colors, or you live someplace where there's something very specific like icebergs that you really want to convey, it's worth um, doing the research and testing all those things. Um, so those are some of the things from Kim McNett's class. Um, the next class was super fun and also... Um, a growth edge for me. And that was the class with Steda. I wanted to get her on the Nature Journal show uh, like a year ago, but then she told me it was winter in Spain and she lives on a mountain in like a 200 year old Spanish homestead with like barely has electricity. Um, and so it didn't work out in the winter for her to do a um, an interview. Um, and then I think she just has, she's, she's a parent as well. So anyways, she, I don't think she's going to be able to make it onto the nature journal show, but she did make it to wild wonder and taught a class. Most people know her for her very bold um, style and her illustrations that she does illustrator of wild things on Instagram. Um, she does, this isn't a really good representation, but she does really cool artwork, very uh, recognizable 
um, in a very specific style. And she taught that at Wild Wonder um, using toned paper. Um, so I have her list of supplies on my list. So the important thing she taught, she doesn't use this brand. She says Strathmore tone paper brown. Um, she doesn't actually use that brand because she's in Spain and has sometimes trouble in this very rural area area getting specific art supplies, but she does recommend it. But the one thing I think is really important for getting her style right is the kind of pencil she uses. And I didn't actually have that pencil, but I'm going to post it right here um, because I think it makes or breaks um, her style. If you want to um, use that style, which is really bold and really beautiful, um, I highly recommend you find the right pencil. And I'm pretty sure that this is the one I spent a while trying to figure it out. Um, but that is the one that makes the whole style work. Um, having that correct pencil. She also uses the, um, Posca markers, um, which are like paint pens. Um, and those can be really nice too. Um, someone else who uses those is Akshay. He has some great pages with those. Um, and she uses fine liner pens. So like whatever microns and she uses a cheap Bic mechanical pencil. And then for black ink, she basically uses a water brush. Um, and then she puts a little bit of ink into a plate and uses that an ink wash. And that's how she gets this varied wash with ink. So basically if you look at it, all she's doing is she's drawing an outline with a, a micron, she, which is waterproof. She's painting sort of um, value, tonal values with um, ink and ink wash. So like here you can see an ink wash I created um, just by putting a little bit of carbon ink into a jar and using my water brush. It takes a very small amount of ink to do that. And then she's using white, um, white charcoal pencil for these highlights. And then she goes back and forth a couple times between those three tools, but it's really simple and really powerful. And she has developed, it might not be the right style for you, but trying it out is definitely worth it. And certain subject matters are gonna be even better with this. So like skulls, skulls, feathers, um, she does these sort of bold mammals, um, work really great with that style. Uh, super fun class. I was really glad that she made it um, to Wild Wonder. And then the last class, I think I'm missing a few because I think I lost, uh, I think there was a class or two that I didn't get to make it to. Um, but then the last class that I got to make it to was Kate Rudder's class. And Kate, I think is still here. She's also one of my Patreon patrons. Thank you so much. Um, and Kate, oh my gosh, she did something totally new. Pretty much nobody is doing this. She did a whole class on nature journaling in um, nature journaling other senses be besides sight um, because um, we've totally over indexed on sight in the nature journaling community. And some people, I think she gave sort of an estimate of percentages. Here we go. This is sort of an estimate of how much of people's nature journaling pages on the nature journal club, Facebook page are um, representing these different senses. So there's about 90% is visual. 5% uh, is, is uh, auditory. Basically all of that is birds. And then the remaining 5% is the rest of the senses. So if you think about it, that's crazy. That's not representational of the senses at all. She describes some of the reasons why that might be, um, some of the challenges, and then she provided a bunch of techniques, including how to develop a visual vocabulary to represent um, these um, invisible senses, these non-visual senses. And one of her main things that she um, taught us was to use this, um, use these four things, describe, depict, picture, and plot. Um, and she gave us these cool rubrics basically for like how to um, use those four things on a bird sound. Basically going from description, um, description, depiction, plotting, and picturing. It was really cool. She did have a bunch, there was some technical difficulties that she was dealing with, but I found that didn't really take away very much from her class. And it's such an important topic. It was basically the last class of the entire conference. Um, so a lot of people were probably tired at that point. And I can only commend her because I know how stressful it can be when you're dealing with technical challenges and you're teaching in front of 
an audience of hundreds of people. However, I personally did not find that it took away from the class very much. Some people were a little bit impatient at the conference, I must say. Um, I kind of wish people were a little bit more forgiving in the comments in the Q&A because there was some rudeness and a little bit of sometimes people were a little bit demanding and a little bit harsh in their comments. And I can understand, you know, if you're, t if you're doing a conference and you're paying for it, that you have, you know, some expectations, but, you know, let's in the future try to be like very gracious. And I know probably like 95% of people really were, but there was definitely some, you know, comments and questions that were a little bit, uh, not nice. And also the other thing I noticed is a lot of times people weren't prepared. A lot of these teachers sent out emails, they had PDFs, they mentioned multiple times where you could download or print these things. And pretty much without fail in every class, there were people asking like, where can I get this? I can't see that or all of that. So thanks to all of the instructors, I know how stressful it can be um, and, hard, and how hard it can be to teach, especially when you're getting these sort of questions can be frustrating, but it was really fun. And um, the one tool that Kate mentioned was the Fudenosuke or Fudenosake brush pin from Tombow. I still haven't tried this one, but if Kate Rudder recommends it, it's probably good. Um, I'll post that last one here. And like I said, um, very soon I will be, in the next few days, I will be posting on my website the complete list. Because right now, if you go into the description below this video, you can find some of the list, but YouTube didn't have enough space for me to post the entire list because some of these teachers had a list of like 50 things that they wanted you to get for their class. I don't recommend buying all of these things, but I at least want you to be able to see all of these things in one place and know where you can find them. Because on the Nature Journal Show, I like to talk about the materials. I like to talk about what you need, what you don't. Um, and sometimes it's really good to um, see what other people are using, especially if they're people that you're trying to learn from. So this is pretty much the last video I'm going to make about the Nature Journaling Conference. Whew, it was a marathon. I commend all of you that were there. Um, and thanks to all of you who are supporting me on my Patreon. I see Lori is here. Eve is here. Um, hi, HG. I don't know HG yet. Um, lots of cool people here. Thanks for joining in and participating in the chat. Eli, Cindy, um, all of you are awesome. And um, I hope that you learned something in this video and I will be coming out with a new video next Wednesday. And I have some special collaborations coming up soon. So I hope to um, entertain you and surprise you with some of those. All right, for all of you um, watching at home or watching this as the recorded version or the live, have a good night, and we'll Nature Journal again soon. Bye.